You're on. <laughs> okay. All right. Today, we are going to be talking about um, uh, pluralism, inclusivism. I'm sorry. Yeah, pluralism, inclusivism, and exclusivism. Um, this will be our last class, sort of on the apologetics end of, of the of the course. Next week, we're going to be getting into Judaism and and Christianity and begins studying the different the different religions. But it's important for us to <clears throat> to see some of these aspects. And um, <clears throat> as we as we kind of get into this lesson, we want to, we're going to be going through some definitions so we kind of understand what we're talking about and where we're coming from. First thing we need to understand is the difference between taste and truth. You know, we we uh, may prefer something, we may have an opinion about something, but that doesn't necessarily make it true. You know, um, <clears throat> the fact that this remote in my hand is black and has a green light on it, that is something that is true. Um, <clears throat> if I say, you know, my wife is, is the most wonderful person in the world, <clears throat> that's taste. Now, there's an aspect of it that's it's true to me, you know, and I can sit here and defend it and say, well, that's, it's true. She's the most wonderful person in the world. <clears throat> but you would have a different viewpoint. You know, you may think that, that your wife or your husband is the most wonderful person in the world. <clears throat> and for you, that is true, but it's a matter of taste and not a matter of truth. And, <clears throat> you know, as, as we get into this, it's going to be important to understand the distinction. Because truth, by definition, is exclusive. Something is either true or it is not true. And as we get into this class, we're going to be talking about how these lines get very blurred about what is truth and what is not truth. <clears throat> Basically, what we're going to be talking about today is, is Jesus the only Savior? And we've got three opinions that we're going to be looking at today. <clears throat> No, he is not the only Savior. Yes, he is, but, and we'll discuss that, and then yes, period, he is the only Savior. So, just to give you some foundational tenets of, of all religions, as, as we look into all these religions that we're going to get into starting next week, <coughs> um, we have the nature of the religious ultimate. All religions... Uh, have an answer of some kind as to what the religious ultimate is, which means what is. Whatever the definition of God is, it could be that God is all, it could be that God is just a force, that there is no personal God, that it's just an energy in the universe. <clears throat> it could be that God is personal. It could be a number of things, but they have an idea of the nature of the religious ultimate, that which ultimately is in the universe. They have the absolute truth in the universe. <clears throat> they have... Another tenet is the nature of the human predicament. All religions ultimately look at what, what is wrong? What's the problem with us? You know, Christianity would say that we have a sinful nature, that we have to deal with the sin that, that, is, that is inherent in our, in our being. <clears throat> um, if you're a Buddhist, you would say, you know, you have to find a way to eliminate the pain in your life, the suffering. Uh, if you're a uh, Hindu, the human predicament is... Realizing that you are God, and how you can somehow come to terms with the fact that you are God. <clears throat> um, and then ultimately the nature of salvation, enlightenment, or liberation. Every religion has some ultimate destination, or ultimate reality, or enlightenment, some place that they uh, ultimately need to get to, whether it's a state of mind, or some place to be, <clears throat> um, or some liberation from this existence. Is there is some kind of a a purpose to their belief system? <clears throat> some more definitions that we want to get into. Okay, <clears throat> divine predication. Okay, we're gonna get, this one. We're gonna get into in a little bit more detail today. This is something that was put together by uh, Thomas Aquinas, <clears throat> and what it basically is is when we assign attributes to God. Um, this is how we form theology. This is how we sit down and basically lay out the belief systems that we have because we 
talk about what God is like. You know, when we say that God is righteous, when we say that God is holy, say that God is loving, <clears throat> whatever, you know, whatever adjective or attribute that we give to God is what's called the divine predication. Okay? <clears throat> Epistemology is a word we're going to need to know. Epistemology is basically the study of knowledge. How, how do we know something? And out of that we get philosophy. We get people discussing the you know, how we come up with ideas and where these ideas come from and the nature of reality and, and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> then we have philosophy of religion, which is the examination of the divine and religion as a whole. It's not looking at, like, what we're doing here in this class, looking at different religions, but looking at, at um, why we come up with religion and what some of the different theories and belief systems that exist because of man's desire to, <clears throat> um, to seek out religion. You know, we want to look at it sort of from the secular viewpoint. And <clears throat> um, so philosophy of religion is sort of a theosophy. It's a, it's a study of religion as a whole. You know, why do we believe and how do we believe? Okay? <clears throat> so we're going to get into divine predication. This is very important for today's class. <clears throat> um, this was put together by Thomas Aquinas, and there's three important terms that we need to look at when we think of divine predication, which is how we give attributes to God. Okay? <clears throat> we have what's called the equivocal, okay? which means God is completely different. He is wholly uh, and ontologically different, and so completely different that uh, it, it, there's, no, there's nothing even to make a comparison to. Okay? Wholly other. Then we have the univocal, which means he is the same. And then we have the analogical, which means he is similar. <clears throat> um, equivocal is, like I said, it means, it means that, he is, that, that God is so completely different that there is no reference for comparison. Um, this would be like comparing, uh, a chair to the nature of gravity. Give me the comparisons. Uh, you know, it's apples and oranges. You're not, it's not even apples and oranges. It's like, you know, apples and, and you know, Sherman tanks. It's not, there's no categorical <coughs> comparison that we can even make a reference to. <clears throat> Univocal is like us, you know. We're we're not ontologically the same, and we're not, you know, we're not being pantheistic here and saying, oh, we're all just one essence of nature. But I mean, we're essentially the same. We have characteristic differences, but <clears throat> you know, I I can relate, you know, to you. I can relate to you, <clears throat> you know, when you talk about love, I understand because I love. You talk about pain, I understand, because I have pain. So we can, you know, we can communicate on a very, very understandable level because we're the same. Analogical <clears throat> means similar. So when we talk about God, okay, and again, we talk about the divine, that divine predication is, you know, we say God is, okay, God is what? Give me something. Yes. What's that? Omnipotent. Omnipotent? Yeah, omnipotent. Yeah. Okay. Okay, God is... Good. God is good. Okay, anything? It could be an adjective of any kind. Just... One and all things. Okay. Just. Okay, just. <clears throat> you know, we can say God is loving. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> Here's the problem we run into. Okay? We say God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. We, be, because we have the word, <laughs> we sort of have an understanding of what all-powerful is. But when we think of how it applies to God, you know, we don't completely understand it. You know, because, well, if God is all-powerful, then you get that... that that, uh, that old ridiculous 
um, sort of a joke when they say, well, can God, if God can do anything, can he create a rock that's so big that he himself can't lift it? <clears throat> well, that's not what omnipotent means. You know, it seems like that's what omnipotent means, but that's not what omnipotent means when, you, when you're regarding, you know, when you're attributing it uh, to God. God is good. Okay? Coffee is good. A churro is good. <laughs> you know? Fresh mango is good. God is good. Are we talking about the same thing? No, we're not. When we say God is good, there, there is a connotation and there, there are, are, are uh, nuances to that word that go beyond anything that we call good here. You know, there's an old <clears throat> um, Bill Cosby joke when he talks about how, you know, when man creates a new car, it's fantastic. When God, I mean, when, when man creates some, you know, some new flavor of ice cream, it's you know, unequaled, you know, in the Bible. It says, God created the earth, and it was good. It's amazing how when God creates something, God just says it's good, but when man creates something, it's fantastic. <coughs> um, but the nuances, when we give an attribute like good, or just, or loving to God, it's, it's different than what we know of as, as these things. <coughs> um, it's not so different that we can't even say that God is good. But we can, we can make a comparison. That's what we're talking about analogical. Okay? When we talk about the divine predication attributes that we ascribe to God, <clears throat> we're doing our best. And that's where we run into things like uh, anthropomorphisms. The everlasting arms of God. Well, does God have arms? No, God does not have arms. God is a spirit. God does not have body parts. You know, we talk about... Uh, <clears throat> the Bible talks about us being sheltered in his, in his wings. God does not have wings. God is not a bird. But we use words to describe a, a thought, an idea about God, so that we have an understanding. <clears throat> and, we can, and we understand that God, there is a similarity in his nature so that we can understand with Equivocal, we say, we can't even say this. He's so completely different that we can't, there's no comparison that we can draw that makes any sense. So these are some philosophical positions. Okay, we have pluralism, which is, uh, we're going to be spending most of our time talking about pluralism. All belief systems are salvific. All, all roads lead to Rome. Doesn't matter what you believe, Ultimately, you can get saved through that method. Okay, you can end up in heaven or whatever it is through that method. We have inclusivism. Okay, Christ's salvation is not restricted to Christians. There's the belief system that salvation is through Christ, but it's not only for those that believe in Christ. And Vatican II is, is, a, is an important example of that. And we're going to be talking about that. Exclusivism is Jesus is the only Savior, and that explicit faith in Jesus is necessary for salvation. <clears throat> and that's why it's, it's exclusive. Alright. So then we've got some philosophical underpinnings. Again, we're still kind of going through some definitions here, so we kind of have some, some things to understand. There's three schools of thought with philosophy of religion. We have what's called fideism, Okay, or fideism, which is a faith-only approach to religion. No proof is needed. We see this a lot in cults. <clears throat> where you, That's why they have to be deprogrammed. <clears throat> People who become so um, changed in their minds because they've been following somebody who has been brainwashing them, who has been feeding them lies and, and doing it in such a way to affect them. And they get brought in and you show them absolute proof that this thing is not true. They, you, you bring in proof that this person that they've been following is not who they say they are, and they go, oh, yeah, you're just trying to trick me. You know, I just, I believe. I don't, I don't need proof. That's fideism. I don't need proof. I just believe. No proof is necessary. No evidence is necessary. I just believe because I believe. Okay, then the strong rationalism, which is, says you must be able to prove everything. In order to justifiably maintain your belief, you must be able to completely 
prove it, that it is not another way. Critical rationalism is where we need to live. Okay, critical rationalism says, look, we can prove something. Some things we can lay out there, whether through logic or through science or through just common sense, we can prove and say, yes, this is true, but not everything. That proof will take us so far, but then there are elements of faith where because of what we have seen, because of the evidence, then we believe. You know, we, can, we see this a lot when we put our trust in a person, a family member, a spouse, a friend, <clears throat> when we say, that person would never do that. And you say, well, how do you know they didn't do it? You, you weren't there. I wasn't there, so I don't have proof that they didn't do it, but everything I know about that person, everything I have already experienced about that person, tells me that they would not do that type of thing. So there is a, a level of knowledge and understanding and experience and proof that leads you to a point where you can then draw a conclusion, even though it, that conclusion is not entirely based on faith. So it's, it's critical rationalism. You know, it's not, you know, fideism is take your brain out, check it at the door, just believe, don't ask questions. You know, strong rationalism says, if you can't prove it, it ain't so. But where Christian, uh, critical rationalism stance is that we can, we can have certain evidences that will bring us to the place where we can make a faith-based conclusion that is not just blind faith. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to be getting the meat of it soon. Okay, some preconditions to understand. This is, this is what makes religious language possible. Okay. First thing to remember is there is a mind. Okay, God's mind. Okay, second thing is there is another mind which is mine, okay, <clears throat> that in order for communication to happen, if I want to talk to you, Tony, I want to talk to you, Roxanne, we both have to have minds. There has to be a mind in there, you know. There has to be some, some uh, vehicle of, of being able to understand the communication. So there has to be two minds involved. So if, if, <clears throat> if there is a God, he must have a mind in order for him to be able to communicate to us. I have to have a mind in order to be able to read that communication, whatever that language is going to be. <clears throat> Which leads us to the third thing, is that there must be a common mode of communication. <clears throat> Something that we can understand, which excludes the idea of the equivocal, that God is so utterly different. Because if God was so utterly different, he would never be able to communicate with us. So there has to be a common mode of communication. And what we have is we have, <clears throat> and we'll, just a little bit more. we have general revelation and special revelation. And boy, that didn't work. Okay. So let me ask you guys, what what is general re general Revelation. Any ideas? Bible. Nope. That's special revelation. General revelation is what we see in nature. Okay. General revelation because everybody sees it. It's available to everybody, <clears throat> and everybody is exposed to it all the time. So we have nature. <coughs> And we have the human conscience. And we have the human mind. You know, I mean, the fact that we can think, the fact that we have logic is evidence of intelligence. That there is intelligence out there. And, as, and we can use that mind to then start <coughs> drawing conclusions, you know, and start getting into some of these apologetic arguments, the teleological argument, <clears throat> that everything seems to have a purpose, so we're here, so therefore we must have a purpose, and if we have a purpose, then we must have a creator, uh, things like um, complexity, when we see complexity in things, you know, it's like the, the watchmaker, okay, if I handed you, if you just were out in, <clears throat> in the middle of the desert, Okay, 
hundreds of miles around you in the Sahara Desert, hundreds of miles of nothing, and you come across a watch, okay, your first assumption is somebody's been here. <laughs> Somebody has been here. And somebody made this. You know, you don't say, wow, look what the sand did. You know, you say, somebody made this. You see a watch, which has complexity, which has operations, which even if it's not working, you see the complexity of it, and th that there's a design in it, and you say, there's a watchmaker. Okay? That's general revelation. We see nature. We see the systems that, that operate in all of... Uh, life that's in nature. We see, you know, everything that's happening in, in the skies. We see the stars. We see the weather patterns. Just the construction of the earth. We have our human conscience that tells us that something is wrong. We do something, we feel guilt. And we say, why should I feel guilt? How do I know what's wrong? How do I know what's right and wrong? There seems to be some universal moral code that tells us that something is wrong. And we don't, even when we're not saved, we have an understanding that some things are wrong. You know, I think we talked about this last week. You know, some people may disagree. Well, is this wrong? Well, it may be wrong here, it may be wrong here. But then some things you say, okay, how about child molestation? Oh, that's wrong. That's, that's always wrong. <coughs> how do you know that? Because there's something in your heart that tells you. So this is general revelation. Right? Because everybody gets this. Everybody sees this. Then we have special revelation. Okay? This is broken down and basically into two areas. One is what Tony just said, which is uh, the Bible. The scriptures, right. Okay, and this is why it is progressive because special revelation has been going on since Moses' day, you know. When Moses sat down and started writing the first five books of the Bible, we started receiving this special revelation. Actually, special revelation has been going on longer than that, too. But we'll get into that in a minute. But when we talk about the Bible, we have a progressive revelation. It has been revealed progressively over the years, over the course of hundreds and you know, thousands of years, uh, to the point that we have the canon of Scripture, the 66 books that we now think of as the Bible. Uh, so that is progressive. <clears throat> there is another element of special revelation. Anybody think of what that is? Christ himself. He is, he is the embodiment of the Word, and he is a specific revelation of who God is. He is a specific, he is the ultimate revelation of who God is. Um... And he communicated specific truth. Now, some of it is recorded in the scripture. You know, and some people kind of, you know, say, well, you know, Jesus is the word, and the word is Jesus, and, you know, that, that's, I understand that. But for the purposes of what we're doing today, we're going to separate the two out. Because we also have, in the Old Testament, what we call pre-incarnate theophanies, or pre-incarnate Christologies, Christophanies, rather where Christ revealed himself, Melchizedek. Okay? Um, the, the, the captain of the host of the Lord uh, to Joshua, you know, when he said, whose side are you on? He said, no, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm, you know, I'm on the Lord's side. Um, and <clears throat> we have different instances in the Old Testament where Christ revealed himself, where God spoke directly to men like Abraham. God, Abraham heard God's voice. That's a form of special revelation. It's very specific, it's very clear, it's very explicit. It goes beyond, you know, this is, this is all kind of very subtle. You know, the general revelation, it's all kind of like, yeah, it's there, it's sort of passive. It's there. And you have to take the opportunity to, to, to really see it and understand it and be affected by it. Special revelation is not passive, it's active. It's coming at you and saying, look, this is who God is. Okay, and this is the common mode of communication that God uses in order to communicate to us. Okay, if, if God is analogical, you know, he, he is 
You know, we are enough like him that he can communicate with us in a way that we can understand that there's a similarity, that this is how he does it. Through general revelation and through special revelation. It's very important that we understand the two of these as we get into what we're talking about. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is pluralism. In order to talk about pluralism, you've got to talk about John Hick. John Hick is certainly not the inventor of, of pluralism, but he is the, or was, the foremost proponent of it. He essentially wrote the book on the idea of pluralism. He developed it. He sort of articulated it and systematized it. He's the major represent, representative of pluralism. This is when he said, there is not merely one way, but a plurality of ways to salvation or liberation taking place in different ways within the context of all the great religious traditions. That was John Hick in 1985. Okay. Now this is a man who has who professed to have an evangelical Christian conversion. He professed to have coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. But what he said was, we need to move from a Christ-centered approach to a God-centered approach. Okay, and this is <clears throat> kind of in, in the next the <coughs> point there, the, what's called the Ptolemaic versus the Copernican view. Anybody remember from the old science days who Ptolemy is and Copernicus? Copernicus? Copernicus is more commonly known. Anybody remember? But his what his big that has to do with the uh, the Earth and uh, what is this, this geosynchronous orbit? Well, it has to do with yeah. It has to do with <clears throat> or um, sorry the Copernicus. Earth. Copernicus. The earth, does the Earth go around the Sun, or the yeah. Sun go around the Earth? Fixed yeah, exactly. Earth, right. Earth, Earth, moving Earth. Exactly. Yeah. Ptolemy was a scientist, you know, an ancient scientist who said, "Look, the Earth is here, and everything—the Sun, the Moon, all the planets, everything we see up in the sky is revolving around the Earth." Copernicus, Copernicus came around and said that things don't work. If, if that's true, that these things aren't moving right, whatever. And Copernicus came up with the notion, hey, maybe the Earth is moving around the Sun. If that's true. And everything seemed to fall into place. Well, this was this was John Hicks' sort of terminology that he used. He said, you know, we, and, you know, we sort of say Jesus is at the center of everything in Christianity because he's again he's professing to be a Christian. He's saying we say everything revolves around Jesus, you know. And what he's saying now is, well, maybe we need, we need to look at it this way that maybe we just need to back up and say there's God and everything sort of revolves around God and Jesus does too and Buddha you know and you know we can put Vishnu in there you know uh, whatever God you want and it all sort of revolves around God so this stuff doesn't really matter so long as you have some desire some inclination toward God all this other stuff sort of revolves around God, so we don't need to put Jesus at the center of everything. You know, <clears throat> and that's sort of his the conclusion he came to. And he came to this conclusion because he said a loving God would not exclude anyone from salvation. Well, that's not a logical statement. No. <clears throat> it's, well, it's an emotional statement. He has a feeling. He says, you know, he, he sort of ascribes this, this sort of thing to God. And that's important for us to see that, is that he says a loving God, which is, which is divine predication. He's saying God is loving. Tony? This doesn't seem to be all that different from inclusivism, especially seeing he professes to have been a Christian. Well, we're going to see the difference. And the difference, initially, I'll just give you a quick difference, is that... <clears throat> Um, inclusivism still puts Jesus at the center and says that Jesus, that absolutely Jesus is God, that Jesus is at the center of it all, but his love is so great that he'll encompass everybody in. Whereas John Hick says, we don't even know if this is even true. And it doesn't really matter. This is the only thing that's true. <coughs> Yet he still said he was a Christian. <coughs> yeah. Because, and, and, and we'll explain why in a minute. This is, but, here's, but here's the problem that, that Hick runs into. is In order to 
maintain this belief of pluralism. In order to, you know, maintain this idea that everything sort of revolves around God, all these different religions revolve around God, is that this idea of God must be unknowable. You cannot know anything about the true God. Because if you can, you know, if you can, if you, if God can somehow communicate, you know, here's, this is, you know, we'll say this is God's mind, right? And here's our mind. If somehow God can effectively communicate anything specific to us, then this doesn't work. <laughs> because if God can communicate to us, then he can communicate the truth to us of who he really is, and that truth becomes the one way that needs to be followed. You know? <clears throat> because he doesn't believe that everything is true. He doesn't say that all things are true. He's not, he's not you know, throwing his brain out the window and saying that all these things that are, you know, that are so different, are, they're, they're all true. He's just saying, we don't really know what's out there. So whatever you believe ultimately will lead to salvation of whatever kind. That's really not all that different from agnosticism, except for the fact maybe that they believe in destiny. Well, the agnostic says, I don't even know if this is even true. He's at least saying that there is. That there is a divine ultimate. We'll get to that. And, and, and part of being able to say that God is unknowable is saying that God is wholly other. That, that equivocal nature of God. That he is so wholly other. He is so totally something else that we cannot even, con we don't even have the capacity to conceive of even a comparison of who he is. Because if we can, then we can know something about God. If we can know something about God, then God can reveal himself to us and we get into that problem. He says God is so transcendent that there is no common mode of communication, not no way of special revelation. General revelation, maybe, a little bit, but nothing specific. Nothing very clear. Nothing... You know, um, and we'll get into what, you know, what general revelation does, can reveal. But he doesn't even believe that it can really reveal anything very clear at all. <clears throat> Certainly no special revelation. Okay, because if God can somehow reveal himself specifically to us, then we run into this problem. How do we say that he is unknowable? How can we say that, you know, <coughs> that all these things are okay if we know something about God? He studied under Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant came up with this. What is that? It's not a race for all, is it? This idea of what's called the noumena and the phenomena. Okay? I know it's over there, but I want to put it here for a second for a reason. Okay? The noumena is, according to Immanuel Kant, is that which, and I don't even, you know what, let's just, let's just use it in Hick's application, because Immanuel Kant's application of, of the noumena and the phenomena is a little bit different. According to Hick, the noumena is that which is, the ultimate reality, okay, <clears throat> that, that, but the key to the noumena is that you really don't know what it is. It's that which is, it's out there somewhere, it exists, but we don't know what it is. The noumena is our mythical interpretation of the, I mean, the phenomena is our mythical interpretation of the noumena. You know, we say there's something out there, we don't really know what it is, so we're going to start putting things, we're going to start attaching things to it, even though we don't know what it is, we need to have something. We need to call it something. So we're going to call it God, we're going to call it Jesus, we're going to call it Vishnu, we're going to call it Buddha. You know, etc., etc., etc. We're going to give a name to it so that we have something to call it. And I'm using the word "it" intentionally because that's the that's the perspective that Hick has. Because we don't know that 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 it could be the god of the pantheist. It could be this. Doesn't have to be personal. You know, it could be personal. It could be impersonal. <clears throat> so we start attaching things to it. We sort of create this mythological, you know, structure of what that thing is. And that's how we end up with religions. Okay? All the various religions that we have. An example is this. You know, I was just down in Baltimore uh, a few weeks ago. 
and it's funny because when I came back, everybody was like, hey, did you see what was going on in Baltimore? Did you get affected by it? Everybody kind of wanted to know what's going on in Baltimore because all we see is what we see on TV. There is something going on down there. There is something going on in Baltimore. There are these street riots. This, you know, this, this place is on fire. There's something going on, but all we really see is what's being reported. You know, and in this day and age, we don't entirely trust what, what's being reported. <clears throat> so, we, uh, you know, we just sort of have this idea, we have this mythical representation of what we're being told is happening, but behind it all, there is something real that's going on, but we don't really know entirely what it is. So it's kind of like that on a much larger, much more uh, exaggerated basis, because at least with Baltimore, we sort of have an idea of what's going on. With the Numina, no clue. We don't know what it is. It's like, you know, it's like there's a wall. You know, there's, all this stuff is going on up here. There's a reality, there's a God or something, there's a force, there's a nature, all this stuff going on up here in the Numina, but there's an impenetrable wall that we hit when we look up, and there, whatever that Numina is, it's trying, it may be trying to communicate with us, or maybe the reason is that it doesn't want us to communicate. There is no, nothing going on between the two, so then we have to sort of, you know, create little pictures. <laughs> You know, whatever it is, it's a, whether it's a flower or a little man or the sun, or you know, we sort of create this mythical idea, you know, of of what actually is, and that's this is what Hick calls the noumena and the phenomena. That the noumena is whatever God is, and we don't know what it is. So religion is this mythical interpretation of 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 that reality, <clears throat> and that's how we end up with all these different religions, and that's why it doesn't matter what religion you practice. Because we can't know God anyway. So, so long as we make some kind of an effort. You know, it, it, it borders on universalism, and it, very, it is very universalistic in its, you know, in its application. Although it allows for, for, you know, Hick to say, well, not everybody will be enlightened. Not everybody will reach salvation. But, he says all the religions are sufficient to salvation. You know, it's different from agnosticism in that he says, "Oh, there is, there's something out there." Agnosticism says, uh, "You know, we don't." At least agnosticism is more honest, because agnosticism says, "I don't know. I, there could be something up there, but I don't know." You know, <clears throat> pragmatically, neither one of them can have a moral code, though. Of course not. Of course, how do you have a moral code if, if, if you don't even know what's beyond, that, what's beyond that line? Do you know why maybe that these proponents of pluralism have such a low view of epistemology? <clears throat> uh, well, because I, I, I would say because how can you know anything, right? I mean, if you can't know the ultimate reality, then anything you know, and this is sort of where Kant, that's where Kant comes in. I mean, that's that's, that's, that's Kant's nihilism. use of this, is that we can't really, everything, everything exists in the mind. That there is a reality out there, but we'll never be able to know what it is, so what, only, the only thing that matters is what we think in our mind. And that's where Kant applies this noumena phenomena thing. Hick just sort of takes it and brings it into the religious realm and uses the noumena as a, as a divine entity, a divine ultimate. You know, so, you know, he's saying, you know, this, in this idea, you can't really know anything. So what's the point in even trying to figure out why you know anything? Well, they're not entirely wrong. I mean, we don't know that we're not in the matrix, but there's degrees of certainty. Well, yeah, and we're going to get into, uh, when we get into the problems with, with pluralism, we're going we're to see where some of this starts to fall apart. Um, so what he says is this, there is only one truth. He admits that. He admits to saying that there is only one truth, but we don't know what it is. Yeah, we, uh, but we cannot know what it is, so our perception can be sufficient for salvation. You know, the truth is out there, but because we can't know what it is, then we really can't be held accountable for understanding that truth. So, so long as we create some sort of a mythical structure, 
that sort of, we feel, leads us into the direction of knowing the unknowable, that's sufficient enough. Okay? So we got some problems with pluralism, though, as, as Tony, you've already brought up. You know, he says his, his initial reason for coming into this is that a loving God would, would, would not exclude anybody from salvation. Well, wait a minute, how do you know that God is loving? If God is unknowable, how do you know he's loving? And therefore personal. If God is loving, then he is somehow a person. He has a personality that is a loving personality. He has an attribute that he can have, you know, express love toward another. So that makes him personal because an, import, an impersonal force cannot be loving. Electricity is not loving. You know, gravity is not loving. <laughs> These are impersonal forces. <clears throat> okay? And he, so he's not only saying that God is loving, but he's also, in saying that God is loving, he's saying that God is personal, which is saying the pantheists are wrong. So even in an attempt at pluralism, he's being exclusivistic because he's excluding out the pantheists. Because in his, in his expression of saying that God is loving, he's saying that God is personal, and the pantheists say God is not personal. You know? Uh, if and this 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 is you know this is one of those uh, statements that begs the question, uh, or is like circular reasoning. <coughs> if God were unknowable, right, the divine predicate, that there is no divine predicate, there's no way of attributing anything to God. If God were unknowable, then we would not know that about Him, right? If God is completely unknowable, then we would not know that He is unknowable. So it's like it's this circular reasoning. How can you know that God is unknowable? It's like saying, I can't speak a word of English. Well, I just, I just did. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it begs the question. It's, it's circular reasoning, and it, it, it doesn't take you anywhere. You can't draw a conclusion from it. <clears throat> um, it also violates two of the laws of logic. One is what's called the law of the excluded middle. Something is, something is either true or not true. Or more specifically, something either something is true or the opposite of it is true. The negation of it is true. An example is this. Rick is mortal. Or Rick is not mortal. Rick cannot be mortal and not mortal at the same time. God cannot be personal and not personal at the same time. Okay. The other law is the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot be what it is not. A cannot equal non-A. This is a marker. We can have different perceptions of what kind of marker, marker it is and you know what, the quality of the marker, but it can, if it is a marker, it cannot be not a marker. It cannot be an elephant. You know, An elephant is not a marker. So this cannot be an elephant. We can know what it cannot be. You know, it cannot be not a marker. And it's just, it's just the nature of logic that something cannot be what it is not. And yet, this is where pluralism takes us. Because again, he's saying that we can know that God is unknowable. <clears throat> In order to make pluralism work, you have to redefine the definition of truth. <coughs> truth becomes so relative that it, it, doesn't even, it doesn't even mean anything anymore. That it becomes, everything is taste. That there is no truth. That everything is just, is just a matter of, and of personal preference. And this is where it ultimately becomes universalism, even though he may not say that it is. Because at what point do you say that this is not a viable belief system? Who has the authority to say, no, this is not salvific. This, you know, that, um, because he, does, he, he doesn't, he didn't claim to be a universal saying, well, look, everybody ends up in heaven in the end. Well, if that's true, if everybody doesn't end up in heaven, then who doesn't? If all faiths lead to God, then atheism is a form of faith, agnosticism, Whatever human sacrifice, you know. I mean, where do you where do you draw the line to say 
No, this, this one is not salvific. So ultimately it leads to universalism. Do you have something? No, I'm just clarifying that that's what that actually is. I mean, all roads lead to God means all roads lead to God, which means everything provides salvation. So that is yeah. a pluralistic view. Yeah. Okay. And, well, and the way he would put it is all roads potentially lead, lead to God. That all roads can lead to God if you, if you know, you if you're willing to follow it. But, yeah, exactly. Again, it begs the question, well, you know, but where does that go? You know, how far, how far do we take that? Um, in an attempt to please all, you must still necessarily offend most religions. And they're, 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 they're foundational tenets. Like I said, if you say that God is loving, and that's why you come up with this whole philosophy, you're saying he's personal, which means you're offending the, <coughs> the, um, you know, the pantheists. But if you say, okay, well then God, well God is neither personal nor impersonal. Well, that's illogical. And now you're offending both. You know, those who believe that God is personal. If you, even if you say God is loving, you can offend some religions because some Muslims say God is not necessarily loving. God is just. God is. God wants submission. God is not a loving God. He is a just God. You know, and <clears throat> so in your attempt to try to please everybody, you end up offending almost everybody. And then the bottom one, again, begging the question, if what Hick is saying is true, then pluralism is just Hick's mythical interpretation of the noumena. You know? I mean, he's, he's, he's saying that there is an ultimate is. Well, how do you know that? That's just your mythical interpretation of what is. Even your saying that there is a noumena and a phenomena. You know, and again, this stuff gets real, like, you know, yeah. it can take you to the moon and back sometimes, trying to figure some of this stuff out. <clears throat> but it's important, because as we start studying other religions, you know, we, number one, like we said last week, we've got to understand where their worldview is coming from, <coughs> what, they've been, what they've been raised up in. And this is some of Hicks' uh, defense of these issues, is, well, you know, a guy raised in Texas, or a guy raised in, um, you know, in Alabama, he was, you know, he was raised around Christianity, so he is going to gravitate toward Christianity. But a guy raised in Tibet, all he knows is Buddhism, then, you know, why should he be held accountable? If that's all he ever knew, you know. <clears throat> and so when we look at these other religions, we have to understand that people are coming from a very personal place. And this is all that they've known. And even, even the underpinnings of their philosophies, their worldviews, are very different from us. You know, we talked about the both and and the either or. Even just the structural mindset is different. You know, and there are religions out there that are very pluralistic. And say, and this is, you know, we, we see this a lot in, 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 in the United States, where people say, ah, it doesn't matter. All paths lead to God. You know, so it doesn't matter what you believe. And, that, and this is sort of the, the mindset that's behind it. And as Ravi Zacharias always says, well, let's take this to its logical conclusion. And you start breaking this apart to its logical conclu conclusion, you say, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't hold water. So the next thing we're going to look at, that's John Hicks' pluralism. So the next thing we're going to look at is inclusivism. And ironically enough, we're going to start with a quote from John Hick. And this is what his definition of inclusivism. When we talk about inclusivism, we find this primarily in Christianity. Or in professing Christianity, anyway. Uh, and some true Christianity, we're going, to, we're going to see in a minute. John Hick says... Here's a definition of inclusivism. God's forgiveness and acceptance of humanity have been made possible by Christ's death, but the benefits of this sacrifice are not confined to those who respond to it with an explicit act of faith. They say, yes, Jesus is the center of the universe. Jesus is the only salvation. We are suffering from our own sin nature. 
Jesus' sacrifice is the only remedy for that, you know, that predicament that we're in. However, Jesus' sacrifice is so magnanimous that it does not necessarily require our specifically putting our faith in Him in order to receive that salvation. Okay? This is, this is broken up into... Did you, What's the, this guy, John Hicks, deal? Is he a pluralist or an inclusivist? You know, he's a pluralist, but he understands, but he understands ex inclusivism as well. You know, he's just taking it to another level. He's taking it beyond... Um, he's not saying that he believes this. He's saying that this is what inclusivism is. You know, that forgiveness was made possible by Christ's death. He has removed that out. You know, and he's and and he would say that he personally may he may personally say or prior to his his demise he would have he may have said personally this is what I believe this is my mythical interpretation of the noumena you know but he says this isn't necessarily true the difference between the pluralist and the inclusivist is the inclusivist says no no this is true there is there is one God and 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 he is Jesus. Okay, but specific belief in him is not necessarily required. And it, 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 what there is is there's two axioms that the inclusivist holds to. Uh, what's called the particularity axiom, which is, and I've got no problem with either one of these two points in the particularity <coughs> axiom. Jesus Christ is the only mediator of salvation, and the lordship of Christ is non-negotiable. Okay? But the universality axiom says that God intends his salvation to be available to all humans, and God gives every human a chance to accept his grace. And when I say that the lordship of Christ is non negotiable, they mean they don't mean that belief in that is non negotiable. They're just saying their belief is that it's non negotiable. That Jesus Christ, if you ask the inclusivist, they will say, yeah, absolutely, Jesus Christ's lordship is non-negotiable to me. However, knowledge of that is not required for salvation. Okay? Because God has made his salvation to be available to all humans, and God gives every human the chance to accept his grace. Okay, And here we see this spelled out in Vatican II, uh, the Catholic Church put out a decree, it says this, those also can attain to everlasting salvation who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, yet sincerely seek God and moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do his will as it is known to them through the dictates of conscience. Since Christ died for all men, and since the ultimate vocation of man is in fact one and divine, we ought to believe that the Holy Spirit, in a manner known only to God, offers to every man the possibility of being associated with his paschal mystery. Yeah, that's a lot of words, but... What's this um, Vatican II? Is that part Vatican II is just, in, 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 from 1962 to 65, the Catholic Church sort of started rewriting Catholic doctrine, if you will. Is this part of the Catechism? Um, I, I don't know. Just, if it's just one, of, one, of the, one of the writings. It's just, it's just one of the one of you know, like for example, one of the things that happened in Vatican II is they stopped doing the Mass in Latin. Prior to 1962, if you went to church, to the Catholic Church, all you heard was a nominus patri et dominica. You know, <laughs> that's all you heard was Latin. Um, after after Vatican II, they said you could do the Mass in English or in whatever uh, you know um, language that you live in. So they sort of made some, they made some changes to the, the Catholic doctrine, practice, dogma, positions on certain things, and this is one of them, you know. Uh, just like recently, they just, uh, the Catholic Church just dropped limbo. They don't believe in limbo anymore. Oh, really? What's limbo? Yeah. Limbo purgatory. is where... Oh, okay. No, no, no. Purgatory is different. Oh, okay. Purgatory is you're good enough not to go to hell, but you're not quite good enough to go to heaven. 
So you're in a holding place in purgatory. And people got to do prayers for you. Yeah, and you can, if, if people pray for you, they can. And what happened, this is one of the reasons for the Reformation, was <coughs> Martin Luther found out that the Catholic Church was selling indulgences, which is you could buy your uncle out of purgatory. You could give the Catholic Church money, and they'll say, "Okay, we'll pray him. You know, we'll pray him out of purgatory for you." And they did this in order to raise money to build the. Um, so what is limbo? Limbos where unbaptized babies go. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, if, if, if a baby dies before they're christened in the okay. Catholic Church, they go in limbo and they kind of stay there for a while. And I don't know exactly know what it was because I wasn't in the Catholic Church long enough to, uh, to yeah, learn it or yeah. to remember it. Uh, that after a period of time, then they're allowed to go to heaven. But they did away with that? Yeah, there's no more limbo. Mm -hmm. Now, that guy's babies are okay. They can go straight to heaven. <laughs> so, you know, so, these are just some uh, things that the Catholic Church changes along the way. Interesting. I guess we can talk about it later, but that must have some implications for their infant baptism doctrine. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but one of the things that they now ascribe to is that, you know what? You don't necessarily have to believe in Christ. You know, again, the way they look at it, and this is, you know, this is sort of the doctrine that gets picked up um, when we think about, oh, what about those tribes in Africa? What about those people in the, you know, in the jungles of, of uh, Peru that never heard the name of Christ? What happens to them? Inclusivism is an attempt to answer that question. Well, God will, God will find a way, you know, that they're, you know, that, that, that just through their conscience, they'll do the best they can. And in doing the best they can, they can be saved. <coughs> okay? Um, but the Catholics are not the only ones involved in this. Okay? Up to 50% of evangelicals believe this. And remember, there's, there is a broad spectrum of inclusivism. There is the inclusivist that says, well, this really only applies to those people that can't possibly hear the name of Jesus. And then there are the inclusivists that say, well, this really applies to everybody. I mean, you know, if you're a faithful Buddhist and you just never really heard the name Jesus or because you were raised in Tibet and that's all you ever knew, so you never really, you know, didn't reject Jesus, but you just never received him, that's okay too. So you have this very broad spectrum of, of an understanding of inclusivism, you know. And, you know, this side over here, most evangelicals would go, no, 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 no. Now, that's not true. But this side over here, you get a lot of born-again believers go, well, you know, I mean, there are some things that the Bible says. You know? The Bible talks about, um, you know, the, the, the Gentiles not having a law, being a law unto themselves. You know? Um, and there, there are places that, that the inclusivists that evangelical inclusivists hang their hat on in certain verses in the Bible. Um, but we run into some real problems with it. We'll get over that. We'll, we'll get, get into that in a minute. But <clears throat> Clark Pinnock is, is, is one of these. He says, God cares more about faith and not theology, trust and not orthodoxy. You know, like how much theology do you really need to know to be saved? Well, I don't think that exclusivism is saying you need to know a lot of theology, but you need to you need to make some kind of a profession, admission of your sinful condition, and then a, a conscious accepting of a specific Savior. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of theology involved in that. I mean, ultimately, the theology can get pretty complex in that, but, you know, he says there's objective and subjective components to faith. The objective components to faith are specific belief in Jesus Christ. Understanding that he paid the price for our sacrifice and that he is the source of our salvation. Subjective is just sort of, I just believe there's a God and I have faith that there is a God out there somewhere. You know, sort of this subjective um, nondescript direction of faith. And uh, you know, what Clark Pinnock says is that that's more important to salvation than the objective components of faith. Now, they say it's not universalism. They say absolutely. They will, they will clearly deny there's universalism. That not everybody is going to heaven. That those who reject Jesus Christ are not going to heaven. 
Okay? But they do say that general revelation is all is, is sufficient.